that was gin mixed with blood. And it was disgusting. But drinking it, allegedly, will make this video have more than 1.3 million views. Let me explain. <clears throat> About two weeks ago, Andy Green, the Rolling Stone writer, sent me a message on Instagram. Hello, Rolling Stone will be publishing a magazine featuring upcoming and underground artists, DJs, producers, bands, and instrumentalists. I like your sound. You're talented. I'd love for you to be in the magazine if you're interested. I thought to myself, why would Andy Green be messaging me on Instagram? And also, who starts a magazine in 2022? So I was actually pretty intrigued by this fake Andy Green, and I took the bait and let the interview begin. How long have you been doing music? Where are you from? Have you ever been published in a magazine before? Uh, yeah, less than a year ago, I was on the Rolling Stone homepage uncovering an elaborate scam that targeted musicians. The irony is so beautifully rich here, please continue. So this goes on for a while, and then eventually, of course, I'm told that there is a settlement in terms of fee for $200, and once that money is transferred, we can commence with a Zoom interview. If you have any hope of finding out more information about a scammer, their weakest spot is the payment. This is the only part of your engagement where they have to directly or indirectly provide you with some sort of link to their real life identity. And they generally know this. This particular scammer is using Cash App, which I don't use nor do I know anything about, especially to use in a forensic way. So I ask Pseudo Andy if he would accept crypto. Of course he does. I ask him if he's okay with me wrapping Bitcoin to speed up the transaction time, and he tells me that he can only accept normal Bitcoin. This indicates that he probably doesn't know that much about crypto and is just following a list of steps to accept it, and naturally he creates a brand new wallet for this transaction. If you're sending Bitcoin manually and not using a broker like Coinbase, there are a few ways you could actually initiate the transaction but not have it confirm enough times to actually go through with the money eventually just pooling back into your own wallet. And that's what I did. I photoshopped a little fake security dialogue box and said that I think that the problem preventing the money from going through is that the address that he sent me had never had a transaction on it before. So the scammer sent me his actual address through a major broker. Now that I have a real wallet address, I could see every single transaction that it's ever made. And since it's a wallet with a broker, that means that if served with a warrant, it would forfeit information. So now it would be time to tell the scammer about the grave mistake that he had just made and offer him a proposition. I could deliver all of this information to Instagram, Andy Green, the crypto broker, and most importantly, the FBI, who will eventually track this person down on wire fraud. That obviously would never happen. Or I will still give him $200, but this time in exchange for an interview about his scam. Naturally, he chose the latter, but this time I said, look, I don't trust you right now, and I'm only going to be able to pay you through PayPal because that way I could reverse the payment if you don't do the interview. And so eventually, he sends me a PayPal address that I could send money to. The PayPal address is owned by a woman, let's call her Natalie, who lives just outside of Montreal in a mobile home park. Hmm. I get in touch with Natalie, and she used to be in a long-distance relationship with a guy who still sometimes uses her PayPal account. Let's call him Russell. Our friend Russell here was born in India, but apparently resides in Ghana, which I think is bullshit. I think only this particular alias of Russell's resides in Ghana because it operates as a catfish as well as a facilitator to get money from PayPal to Sendwave, which is a popular app to send money in Western Africa. Coincidentally, Andy Green's impersonator required a few hours to see if the PayPal transaction actually went through, and I just sent a URL to prove that it went through, but that URL was actually an IP audit and take a wild guess where he was located. Let's hear a story all about how in the 15th century some Europeans figured out that you could kidnap millions upon millions of black people and not only work them to death, but sell them. The Portuguese figured out that there was so much gold in this one particular region of the Slave Coast, they called it the Portuguese Gold Coast. Then it became the Brandenburger Gold Coast, aka the Prussian Gold Coast, until 1721 when the Dutch purchased it. Then it became the Danish Gold Coast until 1850 when all settlements became the British Gold Coast. Then Britain was like, holy shit, there's 
there's a ton of oil here too. Then like 50 years after that in 1957, Ghana finally became independent. However, Ghana wouldn't be pumping their own oil or natural gas until 2010. And since then, $31 billion of oil and natural gas have been extracted from Ghana, with Ghana receiving about 6.5 billion of that. So a 20% cut of their own resources and labor on their own land. Cool. Huh, what else could we do at this place? Oh, all this toxic e-trash we're making needs to go somewhere far away. Let's put that near the center of the largest city in Ghana. With over 6 million Ghanaians making under one US dollar per day, this creates a very unique recycling industry. If you could make more than $160 a month using these recycled computers, you'd be doing better than the lucky people in your country working in energy or healthcare. So what if you were able to help restore the natural balance after everything the West has taken from your land and people? And what if your ancestors could actually give you magical superpowers to help you do it? Seems like the classic Western African scam economy began with the classic pen pal scam and then sort of graduated into the Nigerian prince email that probably anyone watching this has received. Ghana's GDP is growing really fast, and Ghanaians are about 35% more likely to have internet access than neighboring countries. However, the average income remains similar. This creates the perfect setting for scamming Westerners using technology. In fact, scamming has this entire massive subculture of films and music, and originally the difference between sukkawa and scamming was the presence of, I love this word, techno-religiosity. Old traditional West African religion communicates with many gods and ancestors, and those ancestors don't necessarily have a moral compass. Praying to them is more like a flea market for juju, in this case meaning a paranormal power or desired outcome. Juju priests usually live in more rural areas and can communicate with specific gods and ancestors depending on the region. You pay in sacrifices, which can range anywhere from fasting to finding and delivering a specific object to risking your life or even killing someone. And once the ancestor or god agrees to a deal to provide juju for you, you cannot back out of it without grave consequences. Consequences. For example, one can vomit nails or glass until they die, or you might see cat ghosts appearing on your property that nobody else sees, or your newborn baby can turn into a cat. Which is why I drank half a pint of gin with my own blood in it in the beginning of this video. This rabbit hole led me all the way to a man named Chief Baba Natea, who is allegedly one of the most respected priests in Ghana. Baba Natea lives in the rural north of Ghana, just below the Sahara Desert, and he has kindly facilitated a deal between me and the spirits that will make this YouTube video more successful than any other that I've ever made. I will help you. I will help you. You have to do what I am telling you. I will help you, my son. Now you reach me, I will make you happy. That photo, by the way, was me at Chili's the other day because I had to stay in constant contact with the priest and the ancestors, sending them various verbal phrases and live photos of myself. I thought that this ritual would take an hour, but it took an absurdly long time, like an entire day. It was intense. That's a yeah. lot that happened from a from a weird Instagram scam. <laughs> I, I had no idea it would go down so pretty crazy rabbit hole. I really admire your tenacity with this. I'm just Thanks. I read some African as well as Western media reports claiming that as many as four out of five young men in Ghana are involved in Sukkawa, but I don't really buy it. A lot of Ghanaians are Christian or Muslim, which are two religions with a zero tolerance policy for witchcraft. After spending a few weeks talking to a half dozen Sukkawa boys and then digesting hundreds of Ghanaian news articles and YouTube videos, it feels a lot like it did here in the United States in the 1980s and 90s with satanic panic. Churches and the government and the media are all blaming the country's murders and violent crime on Sukkawa sacrifices, and even those seem to be exaggerated. And that's when I realized that digging for more information is futile due to the extravagant amount of misinformation. Don't get me wrong, a lot of lives have been lost, and there have been a lot of horrific and brutal deaths happening in the name of a Sukkawa sacrifice. But from my perspective, most of these sacrifices seem more like 
turning your life into a really long episode of Fear Factor. For example, I've read a lot of stories about having to eat your own excrement or rub it all over yourself before scamming people on the computer. Having to abstain from sexual intercourse or masturbation is common. Having to spend some time in a coffin is common. I've even read some stories about people who have to wear live snakes on their head whenever they're using a computer to scam Westerners. So I feel like I got off pretty easy. I've chatted a lot and kind of become friends with the Andy Green impersonator who scams musicians. Let's call him Jake. I genuinely enjoy speaking to him. This particular scam has not really been that successful at all and has been mostly a waste of time for him. He actually stole the idea from somebody else. He doesn't know anything about Andy Green or how music press works in the West. And it's only one thing on a very long, busy day of romance scams, pretending to be a trucking company that you could hire online, pretending to be a landlord, accepting a security deposit on a house in a city that you have not moved to yet, advance fee scams, lottery scams, and so on. A lot of these are the bottom feeder jobs in the world of Sukkawa. And Jake truly believes that if he saw a priest and bargained with the spirits of his ancestors, that he would be extremely successful. But he's scared. He believes without a doubt that the magic is real. He alleges to have seen his colleagues and good friends travel up north to see priests, then return home and pretty much instantly make life transforming money. But there's always a catch. It's success wrapped in subtle evil. So anyway, I told him I would give it a shot as long as the priest's instructions did not endanger my life or make me hurt another person or animal or something. I imagine some of my viewers might be angry at me for befriending and giving money to internet scammers instead of exposing them or reverse scamming them or whatever. This is a complicated ethical situation, but for the record, I have no problem personally paying people in Ghana to help me understand things better so I could make a YouTube video. Realistically, the vast majority of the time that money is paying for basic human needs like food and housing, not buying stock in some sort of scam operation. Of course, two wrongs don't make a right, but if you want to be mad at people scamming musicians, you certainly don't have to travel all the way to West Africa. There are endless companies that fill my inboxes, promising to have my music reviewed by magazines, played in films, put in television shows, getting tons of plays on Spotify, and they're all part of a legitimate economy of scamming musicians with little to no accountability. If you want to be really mad, the Outlaw Ocean Project, something that is entirely built on misleading thousands of musicians with no consequences or accountability, video link below, won multiple awards for innovative journalism, and it just landed a f***ing Emmy Award last week. And of course, even beyond that, Spotify and all the other streaming services don't even bother disclosing how much they pay in royalties. The companies keep growing in value while paying musicians less and less. Even the good guys, like like ASCAP and music unions lack transparency. All of this is on the back of a hundred years of major labels and publishers notoriously misleading their artists. Maybe the reason that musicians are such good scam targets is because the entire industry that they exist in is a misleading cluster that consistently leads to non-musicians making way more money than the musicians themselves. And that might be why a backwards transaction like paying a writer to allow you to supply them with content for their new magazine project doesn't seem absurd when you view it through the lens of the music industry. By the way, you might be wondering why Instagram doesn't just ban the account of the Andy Green impersonator. Well, multiple people have reported this account dozens of times. I myself have sent Instagram screenshot after screenshot of the impersonator admitting that he is an impersonator inside the chat on Instagram that they can instantly verify. This has been going on for over a month and Andy Green himself has had to create an Instagram account just to deal with it. I think once I'm verified, I could <laughs> not, I could get it taken down maybe and then take, but then take my own down. So I don't want to be on Instagram. He's forced me to join Instagram, which makes me yeah. nauseous. Just this morning, Real Andy tried to get his account verified and Instagram suspended his account. He appealed the suspension and they said that it does not meet their standards of authenticity. Meanwhile, the painfully, obviously fake Instagram account with the obviously fake followers continues to operate without any issue. All of this makes it really hard 
hard for me to direct my anger at someone using it to their advantage to survive in a developing country. There's so much fascinating content here, and this video could have easily been hours long or an entire series, but I feel like it's silly for me to keep diving deeper without actually just going to Ghana. I've actually repeatedly encouraged Andy's impersonator to start a YouTube channel because I think that a vlog of the day-to-day -day life of scamming Westerners from the perspective of a West African would do extremely well here and probably make him more money than he makes from scamming. The world of Sukkawa and West African techno-religiosity is one of those sociological unicorns where you're just so amazed that it's not more prevalent in Western media. I've barely even skimmed the surface. Another thing that has really attracted me that would normally frustrate me in making any sort of content like this is that this video is utterly devoid of any certainty, truth, or objectivity. For example, I was watching some Ghanaian media and they were calling it Sakawa. I was watching some Nigerian media and they were calling it Sakawa. I talked to some Ghanaians and they were calling it Sakawa. I have no idea which is right. The person who put me in touch with Chief Baba Natia warned me that there are over a dozen imposters who actually look very similar to him and who are also actually real priests who do the exact same thing, but just get more business through the impersonation? And I suspect that's because all of this is considered an open secret. It's real-time folklore. Vice has actually done some excellent coverage of Sukkawa. They did release an amazing film like three years ago as part of their shortlist series. That film is coupled with and based on Sakawa by Ben Asamoa, which is an excellent quick read. I think you could get the paperback for like five bucks on Amazon, and I think it's even part of Kindle Unlimited. Also, if you're gonna watch any films or documentaries from Ghana, you might wanna brush up on Pigeon English, and you can read the news in Pigeon at bbc.com slash P-I-D-G-I-N to familiarize yourself a little bit better. Thank you, Andy Green. I'm sorry for finding so much joy in your pain here. Thank you, Chief Baba Natea, or the Juju Priest pretending to be Chief Baba Natea. I'm not even sure what is happening at this point. If this video magically gets millions of views, then my entire foundation of reality will fracture. I spoke to dozens of other people about this in the last couple weeks, some of them scam victims, some of them scammers, and I'm just going to thank all of them anonymously. If you like this video, subscribe to my channel if you want to see more frequently updated content then stalk me on social media. The link's in the description. If you want to support me and see more content like this, and if you want to join an amazing community with monthly songwriting challenges, unreleased music, audio assets, and a whole lot more, then my Patreon is for you, and you can join for as little as $1. And thank you for following me down another rabbit hole. <laughs> Bye.